from the time here. Your story to Christ, our Savior. On the evening of that third day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, then Jesus told them, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise Praise Christ Christ our Lord. These words, it's been recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Thank you, Venerable Laws and Church Wardens and Parish Councillors, for this invitation to admit Parish Councillors here this morning, and for the warm words of welcome um, to the service of worship. It is after Easter, and it is only in the Book of Common Prayer as the very last of our liturgical resources that refer to this week, the past week, as No Week, and this Sunday as No Sunday. So please forgive my low energy levels this morning. <laughs> last Sunday's Gospel, also from St. John, described the first hint and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which the Apostles received. 
And Peter and John convinced that the body has not been taken away by anyone um, because of the winding sheets that were left behind. We're beginning to show signs of belief in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But others were still a little bit skeptical about this. The two travelers on the way to Emos paid no attention to the account that was given by Mary and the other women of Jesus' appearance to them. And Thomas refused to believe even the testimony of his fellow disciples, even when this present appearance of the Lord had convinced them. It is strange for us to just think and focus for a moment about on the fact that the disciples spend, they spend the evening of Easter behind locked doors. What has happened here? Have Peter and others not seen the empty tomb? Did they not hear the conversation between Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ and how she, she accounted to them of this that has happened? And that she particularly was given a message to go and tell them. And so she gave account of, of this encounter and yet they locked behind doors still. One would have expected them to be out there celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive, that he has been risen uh, from the dead. And that they would be keen and eager to announce it to whoever would want to hear and listen to this message. But instead, Scripture says they hide out and they act like disciples of a leader who is dead. And maybe we can argue that on the other hand, they somehow needed to protect themselves. And that makes sense, dear friends. It was only a couple of days before that that they saw their Lord, their Jesus, in a very traumatic way. Um, suffer on a cross and died. He was apprehended and executed in such a violent way and they, and they were afraid. And thus they were waiting behind locked doors, as scripture would have us believe, as quiet as they can. And they would be fearing every footstep in the street below. And a number of them we would recount would ultimately die eventually for their connection with Jesus. Because in this upper room there was quite a number of Christian martyrs. And whether or not the attitude of fear was justified, it is evident that it was fear that dominated them in that very first day. And some of that puts them in the same group with so many other people in this world. Those of us going through life being dominated by fear, it includes many with whom we have had encounters in this world in this very past week. And it may to an extent include us here this morning too. They had loads of company on the evening of the first Easter day when fear kept them inside a locked room. And so friends, it is to these fearful disciples that Jesus, the risen Christ, chose to appear. He has passed from life through a very gruesome death to a life greater than we can imagine. New life, resurrected life, life-giving life, as scripture says. If we just believe, then we will have life in him. And we will have life in him abundantly, so says scripture. And he greeted them with a wish for good health and prosperity um, in spiritual and in material um, matters. He's not just wishing this upon them, he's giving it to them. Scripture says, he breathed the Holy Spirit upon them and said, peace be unto you. Let it go well with you. Let, let you be prosperous in everything that you do. And why does he appear to such as these? He comes, dear friends, back not concerned for himself, but for them. He senses their profound fear. And this is how he speaks peace to them, our Lord Jesus Christ. He showed them his wounds, still apparent on his glorified body, and their fear dissolved. They, dear friends, rejoice to see him alive again, says scripture. And then he gives them peace. And then he gives, this Jesus gives them their mission. The mission that he has promised them before his death which was the continuation of the divine work of salvation that was initiated by himself that they needed to carry forward and on. And he breathed, says scripture, the Holy Spirit on them and he tells them to forgive sins with authority. 
He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And this breathing upon the disciples was a sacramental action of fulfillment of what was promised and is now being fulfilled and delivered on this day of Easter. This action, says Scripture, is a second creation. It is somehow an early um, Pentecost, so to speak. It is a commissioning of them for their ministry. It's a sending out to go and build lives. Their business was to forgive. Theirs was to work the reconciliation of humanity with God and each other. And the model of their forgiveness was no one else than Jesus Christ himself because he has forgiven them. And from this upstairs room, dear friends, forgiveness was to be spread like a wildfire and being set. And as they have been set free from their fears, they were sent out to go and dispel the fears in the lives of others as well and set them free. And so we are reminded again, the second Sunday after Easter, that death could not hold Jesus Christ and neither could fear hold his disciples. And so we reflect on the word of God this morning and we may rightfully ask now what is in it for us here, meeting here 2,000 plus years later. Let me tell you, it is the promise of our own resurrection, dear friends, at the end of time. And the reality of being reconciled to God in a new relationship and with other people in the year and now whilst we prepare ourselves to have that glorified life in Christ then. And like the first disciples, we experience Jesus risen from the dead. Some of freeing us from our own fears of death that will come at the end and liberating us from all the other earthly fears that afflicts our lives today that we, that we, you and I, need to deal with every day. And what are these fears that we experience with, that we need to be liberated from? We worry. There's fear of illnesses with no cure. The faltering economy that we find in our country right now and in the world. Wars. Rumors of wars. Dreaded diseases. Pandemics that we need to deal with. And some of these are a little bit more personal and private. Fear of bad health or broken relationships and marriages. Career threats. Fear of the investment made and the, the, the unstable economic climate in which we operate right now. Fear that we will make wrong decisions. Fear that we, our efforts may be insufficient, particularly when we come to admit the parish council that is supposed to exercise ministry in this context. And so fear when there is no money to cover debt. Fear when there's failure all over around. Fear at the lawlessness and the crime and the theft and the corruption and the many other things that make us forget God. When we should actually be remembering Him and his grace and his goodness. And so for a moment, Scripture wants us to believe that even the disciples forgot. They dropped the ball for a moment. They're in the upper room, and so do we so often in life. And Christ needs to remind us. And so he comes to us with the intense reminders in his feet and hands and sight that death, the source of much fear in this world, dear friends, has been conquered. So the disciples rejoiced that they were happy when they saw the Lord. And so can we, when in the midst of our own fears, dear friends, we recognize Christ's presence with us in different forms and ways. It is not just fear swept away. Rather, it is fear that no longer controls our lives. And there is one who has shown himself more powerful than all these kind of threats that you and I are confronted with in this world and that we need to deal with. And we can enjoy this once and as we acknowledge him as our Lord and Savior. And so the resurrection stories that complete the four Gospels, they are a bit of a challenge testifying to how people came to faith in different ways. It says that the beloved disciple, when he saw the empty tomb, believed. It's not clear as to what he believed. Mary Magdalene believed when the Lord spoke her name, although the account that she gave was not accepted. 
The disciples believed for themselves once Jesus appeared alive amongst them. And so we are also reminded as we reflect this, the gospel reading this morning that people come to faith in various ways. They did then and they do now. Thomas, do, do we remember this Thomas of scripture this morning? Just earlier in the gospel, believe me friends, Jesus when he was preparing himself to go to Jerusalem to face the cross, it was this very same Thomas who said with a bit of boasting, let us also go that we may die with him. Not so subtle, very brave and overtly confident this Thomas who said, let us also go and die with him. But he refused to believe on the account of the other disciples that Jesus was risen. He said, if I could only touch the wounds of my crucified leader. And this morning in our gospel reading, he finally got his chance to do exactly that in the upper room. Jesus entered and he invited Thomas to examine his wounds to prove unto himself that he, Jesus, bore the marks of the cross. And yet he is alive. And friends, whilst we do not hear Thomas's acceptance of the invitation or whether he actually did go over to touch the wounds, the sacred wounds, we instead hear his bold statement when he declared in faith and said, My Lord and my God is alive. And so, friends, Jesus returns to promise us our resurrection as well. He comes back to reconcile us with God and make us, therefore, then also instruments for the reconciliation of others in this world of ours. He's here this morning in his resurrected life to break the chains of fear that keep us in bondage. And in recognizing him, dear friends, we receive new life. We meet him in scripture this morning. We will meet him later in the sacrament that we will share with one another. And the love that is shown us by other Christians in this world. We meet this Jesus resurrected in the depths of our hearts. Even at times when we least expect it. And like his disciples, Jesus would often startle us, dear friends. Like he appeared to the disciples in the upper room. And one week later to Thomas, he will come and he will make his presence known unto us. So be reminded, friends, that this is the Jesus comes in his resurrected life to set us free from the fears of this world. We can extend to him the chains of fear that hold us and he will break them by the power of his resurrection as he has done so many times before and in the lives of so many other witnesses before us, you and me. This Jesus in his resurrected life, dear friends, wishes for us a peace that represents health and prosperity in spiritual and, and in material matters. And it does not just wish this upon us, as scripture says, he's giving it to us. He's breathing his Holy Spirit upon us. He's given us a commission to go out and to minister. He is conferring upon us all in general and for the leadership of the parish of St. George's in particular, dear friends, the mission that he has promised, a continuation of the work of divine salvation as was introduced, dear friends, by Jesus Christ himself. This Jesus of ours is breathing his Holy Spirit upon us as a sacramental action to prepare us for our ministry. So all that I can say to you, dear friends, let's get on with it. The resurrection life of Christ is upon us simply to dispel fear and instill in us the confidence and trust, not just in Him, but in our ability to lead and offer service. And so let's do so. As we pray this in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We group of Christians worshiping today in every corner of the land. And we pray for those persecuted for their beliefs, as were you and your disciples. Like your disciple Thomas, Lord, many of us experience times of doubt and questioning. Help us keep our faith to uphold the faith 
entrusted to us. <clears throat> help us keep faith in you and help us not lose faith in ourselves, for faith is the substance of our hope. Lord God, we pray that the church may proclaim with joy your message of hope for the world. May our lives, as well as our worship, testify the truth of the resurrection. Broaden our vision of what is possible through new life in you. Lord, we ask for your blessing on all the members of the parish council who have been admitted to office this morning. Inspire them throughout their term of office to serve you and the family of St. George's to the best of their ability. Lord God, we pray for the world we inhabit. We pray for the victims of war in the Ukraine and other places of conflict. We pray for all those affected by the devastating floods in KwaZulu Natal. We pray for leaders to know God's truth and be transformed by His Holy Spirit, to lead their countries, regions, and local governments with fairness, wisdom, and honesty in the way of peace and goodwill. We pray for protection against evil and the strengthening of goodness. We bring to you, Lord, our homes and families and friends and all the joys and sorrows of our relationships. We bring to you, Lord, those whom life has, has, has damaged and all those who find it hard to trust you. We bring you those need refreshment and hope, comfort, healing, and inner security and serenity. We bring to you, Lord, those who approach death with great fear and those who die unprepared to meet you. Have mercy on us all. Forgive us all that is past and gather us into your everlasting kingdom of peace and joy. We bring you, Lord, the love of our hearts as we recall the extent of your love for us, which understands our frailty and reaches out to us where we are. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.